Okay. Um, from there, because uh, I am a compliance geek, I'm just going to jump into our normal hefty disclaimers. Uh, so I am not a lawyer. Well, Lori is a lawyer in the context of this presentation. She is not your lawyer. Um, and nothing that is said here should be interpreted as legal advice. We're going to be talking about different governments and government agencies, but of course we're not uh, the representatives of the official positions of those government agencies. Uh, and what we're saying shouldn't be interpreted that way. Um, if you have questions about a particular situation or company that involve anyone's name or any type of confidential information, um, please feel free to reach out to us after this presentation. Um, don't ask those types of questions in what we consider to be a public forum. Um, and if, if you have a question that's more theoretical in nature, um, maybe just strip out the names of any, any, you know, any companies or individuals or anything like that. Um, and finally, information should be free. And so if there's any of these resources um, or anything that we talk about today that you want to repeat, um, of course, you are free to do that. I'm going to jump into, uh, so here we have a slide that just has a couple of the key resources. So there's two articles that have been written um, by Laurie and her team at Osler about um, guidance from the Canadian Securities Administrators, as well as um, a, I, suppose requ I mean, request for comment, a theoretical framework that they had put out a while earlier. And so where I'm hoping that Laurie will start is, is just to guide us from um, that theoretical framework that was released, what was that, what does it look like, and, and what did the most recent guidance say before we jump into some questions? Sure. Um, thanks, Amber. So, yeah, the guidance came out in January of this year, and um, it's CSA Staff Notice 21-327, and the guidance is an interpretation of staff at the securities regulators of all of the each of the provinces and territories of Canada, which are collectively have collectively taken the view that a crypto asset trading platform that doesn't immediately deliver the crypto assets that it transacts on the platform to its customers may be subject to securities or derivatives laws maybe may, by saying that what they mean is that if the customer doesn't receive delivery of let's just for the sake of simplicity use bitcoin as an example customer goes onto platform customer opens account on platform customer buys bitcoin and rather than getting that bitcoin delivered to the customer's personal wallet that's somewhere outside the platform the customer chooses to keep the Bitcoin on their wallet or in their account on the platform. The view that the securities regulators have taken in this guidance is that in that case, the transaction that's been conducted on the platform is not a sale of Bitcoin. Rather, it's a sale of some other bundle of rights that includes the right to take delivery of the Bitcoin at a future time, but is not, is it, but the transfer of ownership of the Bitcoin has not yet been completed. So the customer holds either a security or a derivative, the right to receive and to take delivery of the Bitcoin, but doesn't actually, hasn't actually received delivery and doesn't yet own the Bitcoin itself. And the result of that interpretation is that platforms that are selling those rights are selling are in the interpretation of staff a security or a derivative which would mean that the platform would therefore need to be registered as a dealer in securities or a dealer in derivatives under securities laws in order to engage in those transactions with customers um, so this is a, an interpretation that is, is allowing staff to staff of the securities regulators and the securities regulators themselves to exert jurisdiction over crypto asset trading platforms that are, in, that are um, offering services to Canadian customers. Um, up, to the, up to the point where this, where this guidance was issued, this was a gray area. And so now just stepping back to a year ago or March 2019, 
post quadriga meltdown. Um, and I'm sort of assume I'm going to make some assumptions that the that the group that's here is familiar with quadriga and what happened there and the loss of Canadian assets. Um, the regulators got very concerned about investor protection issues around you know Canadian retail investors, Canadian retail clients buying Bitcoin and other crypto assets with their hard-earned Canadian dollars leaving those crypto assets on the trading platform that sold the assets to the to the customer and the platforms not being regulated in any way but we can talk about msb re registration in a minute um and then the these retail investors being exposed to all kinds of risks associated with those platforms including operational and technology risks um, cybersecurity risks, but at a more fundamental level, fraud risk, um, bad people, bad people, investment scams, the kinds of things that securities laws are really designed to try to protect investors against. And um, there has been a regulatory vacuum in Canada and in other jurisdictions globally, and there and and particularly post Quadriga, I think that the securities regulators here feel um, an obligation as part of their investor protection mandate to step in and to shut down or to, to, to ensure that platforms that are offering these services to Canadian retail investors are fit to be doing so. And under securities laws, if you wanna be a dealer or you wanna be an advisor, or you want to be an investment fund manager, you need to be fit for registration. And that means not only that you need to have specific, you know, your individuals need to have experience and educational proficiency requirements that allow them to do, that give them the experience necessary to do their jobs, but at a more fundamental level, that these people are not criminals, that they are good upstanding members of society, and as at the very beginning the, of the registration application for any firm that's being registered under securities laws, it's, it's very basic questions about the individuals. What's your name? Have you been known by any other names? Where, have you, where do you live now? Where have you lived for the past 10 years? What have your jobs been? What other potent, what conflicts of interest are you in? And all of this information is really designed as to provide a very baseline of investor protection um, to allow the to to give the regulators tools to ensure that um, you know firms and individuals that are dealing and advising in securities are are you know not are unlikely to be engaging in fraudulent activity. Over and above that, there's a whole very complex regulatory regime that applies to securities and derivatives dealers where they need to meet certain capital requirements and have insurance in place and have compliance systems in place and maintain records for their clients and do KYC on their clients and ensure that investments are suitable. And that's a whole other topic that we can talk about, but at a very fundamental baseline level, the purpose of the registration regime is to make sure that if you're dealing or advising in, in securities and derivatives, you're not out there you're not you're not out there trying to perpetrate fraud. You're not misleading investors. You're 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 providing safe um, transactions to investors. You're ensuring that their that their investments are adequately safeguarded. That they're being held by a custodian. All of these things. So the question for I think the people that are on this call that are likely or at this meeting that are likely in the business or have thought themselves to be in the business of of um, dealing in crypto assets, which are not securities or derivatives, is, is this right? Should this apply to us? We've met most platforms see themselves as money services businesses. They're, they're buying or selling in a spot transaction. So the ownership is transferred at the time they take the cash or whatever, they take the other crypto to the customer. And if the customer chooses to leave their assets once purchased at the on the platform 
the platform takes the view that it's holding those assets really as a bailey for its customers. So the assets already been, the, the Bitcoin has already been sold, but the customer is choosing to leave it on the platform because the platform is providing it with the customer with security. The customer doesn't have their own wallet. The customer doesn't want to manage their private keys. The customer doesn't have cold storage, whatever other reasons the customer wants to leave the asset on the platform, but it's not, but the platforms have not historically conceived of themselves as trading in securities or derivatives. Um, so there's a pretty big disconnect between um, how the platforms have seen themselves and have seen their relationships with their customers and the way that this guidance is framing the relationship. Um, and that is really, I think, where we're at right now. And it's creating real challenges for, indus for the industry. Um, and it's also creating challenges for the regulators because even though the regulators are taking this view that these custodial, we'll call them custodial platforms, ought to be registered as dealers in securities or dealers in derivatives. The reality is that the registration framework that currently exists for retail facing, facing dealers in securities, which is IROC registration, isn't designed to regulate a crypto platform and, uh, and doesn't have sort of some of the necessary systems, doesn't doesn't contemplate digital asset custody, doesn't contemplate different proficiency. So there's a, and, and also is not in a position to offer insurance to these, to these, to platforms, even if they want to get registered. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation. Um, and just one other topic I want to cover at a high level. And then I think we should start sort of, I want to get a sense of where people are at and what they're interested in talking about. But just stepping back to, again, the March 2019, the, the initial CSA IROC consultation paper indicated that, that the regulators were working on a, special, on a new framework that was going to regulate crypto asset trading platforms. And that was going to be based upon the current framework that exists for securities and derivatives dealers, but that was also going to be designed to acknowledge the ways in which digital assets are different and to foster innovation, to not to, to, to allow for some flexibility to develop new systems for regulation and new requirements that would, um, that would allow these platforms to continue to operate as long as they're not exposing invest, as long as they're dealing with the investor protection risks that registration has really been designed to address. Um, and as part of that process, a whole bunch of comment, I think there were 30 some odd comment letters were submitted to the CSA. Um, in October of 2019, IROC struck a working group where IROC, which is the self-regulatory organization, it's a national organization that regulates dealers and advisors, struck a working group full of um, you know, people from the crypto industry and lawyers and auditors and different stakeholders to try to wrap their heads around how to regulate the sector. And that just happened in October and there's work that's being done. But I think that this guidance kind of took people by surprise, took industry by surprise, because the guidance is suggesting that like right now, starting today, if you're a platform and you're a custodial platform, you need to be demonstrating that you're taking steps to comply with securities laws. And what those steps are in, in this current environment is very uncertain. Um, and so far, the messages that have come out of individual securities regulators that have been talking to platforms is the purpose of this guidance is to get the platforms to come in and to start to talk to the regulators and to engage in a dialogue and to figure out what to do. It's not to scare platforms into thinking that you know, the securities regulators are going to be busting down their doors and starting enforcement proceedings tomorrow. Um, I think that it's pretty safe to say that absent um, an acute investor protection issue, that's unlikely to happen. But I think that it's, it's the time is coming closer that no, we're no longer in wait and see mode. We're in something's going to happen. And a uh, framework is going to get developed or and you're either platforms are either going to be expected to register or get an exemption from the registration requirements or go to a completely non-custodial model which gives rise to a whole bunch of other 
investor protection issues and also the needs and wants of customers who don't want to be taking delivery right away. So I think that that's sort of an overview of where we're at right now, um, high level. And um, I, what, uh, what I'd like to do really is to provide ev everybody here with information on what does this mean? Like what is being registered as a securities dealer or a derivatives dealer mean? You know, cause it's probably a kind of a new concept to a lot of platforms. And, how is this different from being an MSB? Isn't being an MSB good enough? And, um, but, but I really, rather than me making up hypothetical questions and answering them myself, I'd much rather hear from you guys about what you're interested in and how, how you know, I can help you in some way to sort of navigate what's, what's happening um, in, in securities laws. So opening it up to questions and comments. Perfect. Can I can I selfishly um, jump in with the first question that uh, I know a lot of my colleagues and clients have had? Sure. Um, I think that we're hearing things in two very different and, and very dichotomous narratives. And so there's the guidance, the, the most recent CSA guidance that came out that actually said that there can be regulatory penalties um, if platforms are not being compliant with this notice. Um, and then there's a narrative that I think is a little bit conflicting, um, which is that this was just meant to spark a dialogue. It's, it's meant to start a conversation. And so, you know, where between those two extremes does the reality fall? And practically speaking, um, if I'm if I'm running a, a you know Bitcoin exchange and we don't we don't always deliver immediately or we have some form of custody that we're using, what's my first port of call if I get a letter from my regulator um, or or from my local securities regulator, whether or not I consider them to be my regulator yet at this point in time, um, asking for information? How risky is it really? Because I, I think it's different depending on which one of those narratives you're following. That is a very good question um, or a series of questions, but that we, if we can unpack, but um, it is true that when you read the words of the guidance, the words are scary and the words of the guidance were very carefully considered and are designed to be the, the stated position of staff. So whatever is being said in one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, the stated position of staff is what's in the guidance. Why is that important? Because again, this is just a staff interpretation. This is not the law. So if staff did commence an enforcement proceeding against a platform, against a custodial platform, on the basis that that platform was dealing or advising in securities or derivatives without being registered. An enforcement proceeding is a legal process. There would be, um, you know, a notice served on the platform. There would be a request, there would be um, you, and the platform would be protected by due process of law. They'd be encouraged to get counsel. Um, they would be examined under oath the documents and um, other information that they would be providing in response to an investigation would be protected, would be all governed by a legal process and any advice um, that they'd be receiving from their counsel would be protected by privilege. So we're talking about full law. It's not a court proceeding, but it's an administrative proceeding that has the protections of due process of law. In that proceeding, a platform could take the position that it's not dealing in securities and derivatives, that it's that staff's interpretation is incorrect. And that is, you know, that is totally possible and plausible. I'm not a litigator. One of my close friends and colleagues is in is here. He is a litigator. Um, and, you know, these are the kinds of arguments that litigators would make. Um, and then, but where would this proceeding take place? The forum for this proceeding would be the Ontario Securities Commission itself. So when you have an enforcement proceeding and the platform say that was subject to the proceeding 
doesn't enter into a settlement with staff, they don't agree, they want to fight this, it would go to a hearing. And the hearing would be before a panel of commissioners. So now we're at the administrative tribunal part of the Ontario Securities Commission, which is different from staff. It's different people. They have different experience. They have different perspective. The people that are commissioners are generally senior, experienced, you know, pro, um, individuals that have that are capital markets participants that have spent their careers working in banking or working in not in banking, but working as to in you know the securities dealer industry or working as as um, as compliance professionals, as lawyers, as auditors. So they bring different experience to bear and they don't, aren't necessarily gonna agree with staff's interpretation. That being said though, the twin pillars of securities laws are investor protection and fair and efficient capital markets. So whenever you have a, pan, a commission, the panel of commissioners and asking themselves, how do I apply the law in this context? Do I agree with staff's interpretation? They're always guided by those guiding principles, investor protection and fair and efficient capital markets. So when, if staff advances the position that our legal interpretation is based on the mandate, our mandate to protect investors, um, I think that my expectation is that that's a fairly sympathetic position. And I think that it's gonna be it will be a challenge, I think, for a platform to demonstrate. And not that it's not that it's not doable, but I think that a platform is going to have its own work cut out for it in terms of making those kinds of arguments, which are very much le theoretical legal arguments based on statutory interpretation, um, in the face of kind of true investor protection issues. And I say all that because I think that the likelihood that there's going to be an enforcement action against the platform, it's going to come up if there truly is an investor protection issue. We're talking about another Quadriga or an Einstein or something along those lines. Um, so I'm not expecting that a platform, a custodial platform that's going about its business, that is, do, that is registered as a money services business or, is, or is, has pre-registered, you know, pending the June 20th, um, deadline, June, tw June 2020 deadline, um, and, and that is actually, that does, is protecting its customers and has adopted, um, you know, best in class with the crypto industry, you know, cold storage technology and proper customer record keeping and reporting. Um, I just don't, the, given the resources of the securities regulators that are out there, I'm not expecting that there's going to be a whole bunch of enforcement proceedings against those platforms. Um, what's more likely to happen and what already is happening in some jurisdictions is a reach out for information. So I think that that brings us to sort of the second part of your question, which is sorry, if you get sorry. a reach out, sorry. Well, just okay. Before you move on, um, there's just a, a question related to what you just talked about with, with enforcement. Um, and that is, is the enforcement process entirely complaint driven? That's a good question. So, and I think that that's basically what I was saying. It's not entirely complaint driven. So the OSC is definitely listening to investor complaints and it's out there with its ear to the ground, but it's also doing its own market surveillance. It re, it, the OSC staff have read all of the platform's websites, how the platforms are marketing themselves, what they're saying that they're doing for their customers, what their terms of use are, if they're recommending certain investments, if they're telling uh, retail clients that they can make money, that this is, you know, buy Bitcoin because it's going to go up in value, those kinds of claims, the regulators know that that's happening. Um, so, and if the, you know, and, and so they, they, they look at those types of risks too. So no, it's not entirely complaint driven, but it is, comp but it is definitely investor protection focused. So, um, again, I think that the likelihood of an enforcement proceeding being commenced absent some evidence of investor harm is very, it's, I think it's very low. But, but don't I, have your marketing saying risk-free Bitcoin investment today. That's just courting trouble. And another, another area that I've seen, another, other, and my background before I got ended up in this fintech 
situation. I don't even know how I got here sometimes, but my background is that I'm an investment management lawyer. My clients historically have been on the buy side. So asset managers, portfolio managers, advisors, mutual fund companies, et cetera. So they are offering, they, so those types of um, activities are not just dealing. So we're not just talking about, I'm going to, I will buy and sell. I will act as an intermediary for you. I'll buy Bitcoin from you. I'll sell Bitcoin to you. We're, that's dealing. And if Bitcoin is a security or if Bitcoin is a security, which it's not, then you're dealing in a security. But the other part that gives me, that has given me a lot of heartburn when I've seen it on platforms is advising, is saying like, you tell us how much money you want to spend and we will tell you the optimal portfolio of crypto assets to buy for your money. We are going to recommend, you know, this much Bitcoin, this much Litecoin, this much Ether. That 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 takes you into a different world, which is the world of advising. Um, and in the world of advising, I think even if even if you have taken pains to ensure that all of the tokens that you're advising on are likely to be considered commodities and not likely to be considered securities. The mere fact that you're making recommendations about strategies for investing is going to really put you in the crosshairs of the regulators. So I would be very careful about those types of um, solicitations and value propositions. Um, so I, I, I was about to talk about, and I'll just, it, I, I, I won't start, but I was about to talk about what's going to happen before you get to enforcement. What's the less formal process and how can you navigate that process? Before I do that, I'll just see if there are any other questions on what we were just talking about. Nope, that's what we've got so far. So yeah, if you want to keep rolling, um, please do. Okay. So, so, so what are, what are, what are securities regulators going to do if they don't get a complaint, if they don't think that a platform is, is putting in client assets at risk or is misleading clients or is, or, but, but they're just, they just think that the, the, the staff know that these platforms are out there, that they're providing custodial services. Um, what are they going to do? So in a lot, in a lot of, for a lot of platforms, You've already gone out and you've already initiated conversations with your securities regulator because you've known about this risk for a while. So you may already be on the radar screen of the regulators and you might have a relatively positive or good relationship with your securities regulator uh, to date. Um, you might have already responded to a voluntary request for information over the past couple of years in which you might have already confirm that what you're that you do provide, you know, a custodial platform. Or you might have never heard, you might have never communicated with the regulator. But as I said, even if you haven't communicated with the regulator, they've read your website, they know what you're doing, and they know whether or not you are you are offering custodial accounts. So, so if you don't go, if you don't initiate a dialogue with the regulator in response to this guidance, saying, "Hi, regulator, we get it. We're dealing in securities or derivatives. We want to get registered." And I think that that's an unlikely response. Um, you can expect, I think, to be contacted by a regulator, not in the context of an enforcement proceeding, but in the context of a voluntary request for information. Um, and that will be sort of a list of questions or a come on in for a meeting. Um, and they'll ask you, you know, who are your clients? Who are your, who are your clients? Um, what kind of stuff are you selling on your platform? Do you, what, do you offer custody? How, how met, what's your volume of transactions? Like they'll, they'll ask you some, please describe your business, more even general questions that are designed to get further information. I would strongly recommend consulting with external counsel when responding to those questions. Um, I would strongly recommend considering the privacy law obligations that you have to your customers when you're responding to those questions. And I would also, um, you know, consider the fact that you are or are going to be registered as a money services business. You have a compliance program in place. You have customer records in place and you are regulated in some way. So, um, you know, I, be, be cautious and judicious 
when responding to the regulator. But don't, but the regulators are, <laughs> they're reasonable people. And what, in, in, in one-on-one -on -one conversations with the regulators, um, they're, they're not looking to shut down your platform or drive you out of business. They're looking to make sure that retail investors are, are protected in their jurisdictions. And the challenge I think that is being faced by industry right now is that there is a gap between what industry thinks it should be doing to protect consumers, which it sees as consumers that are buying and selling Bitcoin or Ether or whatever else on the platform versus what the securities regulators consider platforms to be doing, which is dealing in securities or derivatives, which has a much higher onus of investor protection associated with it. So can, oh, I, just, can I jump in there with a quick related question? Um, this is a voluntary request for information. How voluntary is voluntary really? And is just saying, no thanks, um, an option there. I would say, and I haven't, um, I haven't had direct experience with this, but I would say that if you decline to respond full stop, it is more likely that, an, in, that, you would, that staff would then go and get an order to compel you to respond and you would be moving your file into, an inf into enforcement land from market regulation and from um, from compliance and registrant regulation land, which may be where you, and that's not necessarily the worst strategy, you know, it really depends on what your objectives are and where you want to be at the end of the day. Um, and, and what your view, what, what the ideology is of the platform and, and what your views are on this. Um, so again, like that's why I think it's important to consult with a lawyer and to really understand what your options are on the basis of where you want, wh what you want to achieve through the process. Right. So, so really something that if you're getting that letter, you want to have that discussion with your lawyer and your management about what the risk is as opposed to just responding, you know, we decline. Yeah. 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 Uh, you, you, there is, you, there's no, there's, it's not going to be over if you say no thanks. So when you say you should be educated before saying no thanks on what, what the, out, what the potential outcomes of that would be. Awesome. Fair. Um, Sorry, go ahead. There was something else, sorry, that I just, I, I wanted to um, touch on, which is um, the interaction of this with the money services business registration, which I think, which I, which I think is a baseline expectation for, you know, that any platform that's doing sort of digital asset value transfer is going to be registered as a money services business. Um, I think that um, that the expect I think that the expectation is that you would that you will have, you know, compliance policies and procedures in place that are going to satisfy the KYC requirements and the reporting requirements um, for an MSB, including the you know the the risk assessment of your business, including um, having, including thinking about how you're going to be complying with things like the travel rule on a go forward basis. So I think you know if you're working on the, those things and if you've got all that in place, it's going to demonstrate that your organization is taking compliance seriously. Um, and and an interesting topic that you know we we have, we have to think about is that if a custodial platform is going to be regulated as a securities dealer or as a derivatives dealer, um, does it make sense for them to also be a money services business? Because when you think about securities dealers and derivatives dealers, their license allows them to hold, to provoke, to trade and cat, to have transactions where one side is fiat, the other side is a security or a derivative, to hold cash in their accounts and to report on that basis. So I think that there's a potential duplication there that we're, we haven't gotten there yet, but that's certainly on the medium term radar screen for those of us in this industry, which would be that it would be, I think, a pretty unfair result for a platform to have to be, have to be, to be regulated under both sets of rules as a reporting entity. Um, 
one other thing I wanted to mention also, and, and I, I won't go too deep into it. It depends on the interest of, of you guys. So you'll let me know if you're more interested. But in addition to the being a dealer, because you're buying and selling, um, you're buying and selling crypto directly in the sort of bilateral transactions, there's another issue, which is if you're making a market, if you if you're have an order book, if you have an order matching functionality on your platform where you're matching buy and sell orders, because that in, if you're doing that and if what you're trading is not Bitcoin, but a, a security or a derivative that, which gives you the right to receive Bitcoin, then you're also in the land of being a marketplace. So not only are you going to be subject to registration as a dealer, you also potentially are going to be subject to regulation as an alternative trading system or some kind of marketplace that isn't, you know, a securities exchange, but there's a different and related regulatory regime for marketplaces, which also requires IROC registration, but, but there's a level of market surveillance um, and compliance and reporting that applies to a marketplace, so a platform that's doing that order matching that wouldn't apply to a platform that's just engaging in, in dealing. So I did, I did want to mention that as well. And it's a more complex and more expensive um, registration category and regulatory regime for those platforms. Awesome. That's a lot of information. Um, yes. <laughs> we've got a question here um, that was heavily nuanced. Um, and it's been dumped down for me because it might have been a little too deep. But it, it's in short, uh, is a DEX smart contract or cross-chain atomic swap equivalent to a futures contract or some other regulated derivative product? Okay. I, I, I know something about atomic swaps, but I don't want to pretend that I understand the technology in its entirety. Um, I will say that if the objective of the transaction is to provide leveraged exposure or, or, or to provide a mechanism to profit off of a change in price of an underlying asset, and in particular, if there is leverage that's being made available through the use of the contract, it is there's a reasonable likelihood that that contract would be seen as a derivative would be would be would be interpreted as a derivative and quite frankly the the addition of leverage and the fact the likelihood that physical delivery of the underlying asset is not contemplated or expected um, does lend itself to i would say being accurately characterized as a derivative that all being said, though, with an atomic swap, if, if after the split second trade, there's no risk, whoever facilitated the swap, and I think that the swaps are totally bilateral. So it's a completely bilateral transaction between each side of the trade. And at the end of the day, there's no risk that's being borne by an intermediary, then I don't, I don't see, I'm not sure where the regulatory risk would be, but if there's an intermediary that's offering the contract and that's making a spread off of the contracts, then, um, and, and, that, and is exposing investors on either side of the contract to risk, then I think that the regulator is going to do what it can to get that contract to fall within its purview. That's the best that I can do on that. I'm sorry that I don't have a more technologically sophisticated response. I, I think that was good. I just have one question because you're using a term that I think is really, um, it, it's defined differently in different areas um, of law and compliance. So when you're talking about an intermediary bearing risk in this context, um, what do you mean by risk? So I'm talking about counterparty risk and credit risk and insolvency risk. So if, if the, con if the, if the buyer or seller of the contract is exposed to ongoing risk associated with the other side, that's what I mean. So, um, but, it, but in an atomic swap context, my understanding is that it, it happens instant, that it happens instantly. The, whatever the value is, is transferred 
instantly, but if they're, but, and maybe, I, I mean, I'd be open to whoever asked the question to providing further clarity on this, but if the contract is sitting out there and it's open for a period of time where there is ongoing counterparty risk, so if the other side has promised to perform the contract, uh, has promised to perform, and that promise is outstanding for a period of time, um, that is the kind of risk that I'm talking about. So if on day one, the promise is made and somebody pays consideration for that promise, and then on day 30, when the market move happens and the counterparty who's agreed to pay an amount is gone or is doesn't have the money to pay, that's that's the very risk that is the reason that futures trading and and over the counter derivatives trading now so swaps otc swaps are now regulated and they're now centrally cleared awesome um there's an fyi uh the person who asked the question said great answer off the first one oh. uh, yep <laughs> uh, there answer. was a there was like a kind of a second half to that question but i think you've kind of implied it i'm not 100 percent, so i'd just like to clarify um the question was kind of like if that was um something that would be regulated where would the, the jurisdiction fall and i think because there's there's now a party in a, like a, a third party or a separate party involved there would be where they were located how does that so how does that work the, when we're talking so let's talk i want to talk generally about jurisdiction and over the count and swaps and sort of where we're at in canada so so it when you're saying whose jurisdiction would you be under so so offer or of swap counterparty to swap um, your principal regulator if you are subject to securities and derivatives regulation is where your head office is located if your head office is in Canada if your head office is not in Canada it's where oh sorry hang on I'm just deleting something from my screen here if it's not if your head office is not in Canada it's wherever the most of your Canadian customers are so that's sort of, that's the way that the principal regulator system works here because we've got the 13 regulators. Now, the world of derivatives regulation is more complex than the world of securities regulation in Canada. We are not as harmonized on derivatives at all, unfortunately. There's a pretty broad range of approaches that have that are to derivatives regulation in the different uh, provinces. Quebec has a derivatives act and Quebec reg registers derivatives dealers. I'm not licensed to practice in Quebec, so I, don't, I only have very high level information on this, but I believe that, e that over-the-counter derivatives trading, so um, not just for clear, not for futures and options contracts that are traded on a traditional futures exchange, but OTC, you know, swaps and other types of derivatives are regulated under that Quebec Derivatives Act. So if your head office is in Quebec, or if the majority of your clients are in, of, of your of your customers are in Quebec, there is a regulatory framework there in which you could get registered if you think you should be registered and if you want to be registered. In the rest of Canada, um, over-the-counter derivatives regulation is not quite where it should be. There is there are some rules that are in place that require. Um, for, on the, for the purpose of trade reporting and trade repositories and a product determination rule. So if you're trying to figure out whether something is or is not a derivative in that jurisdiction, there are some rules that will help you. If you're looking to get registered as a dealer in derivatives in most provinces of Canada, it's not really a fully baked registration category yet. There, are, there is a draft um, national instrument that will, will be adopted in, that provides a registration requirements and all kinds of proficiency requirements for dealers and derivatives, just like what we have now for dealers and securities. And there's a, in, in that regime, it's contemplated that not only is there going to be a chief compliance officer, there's also going to be a chief risk officer that's going to have certain proficiency. Um, there's also a business conduct rule that applies to all market participants in over, that will apply to all market participants in the context of over-the-counter derivatives, even those that don't have to be registered. But so neither of those rules is in final form yet. They were published in draft form, I think, in 2018. It might have even been 20, late 2017, and we still haven't seen a revised version of those yet. And 
in the interim of all of that, the whole crypto asset trade, the crypto asset issue has really bubbled to the surface. And in other jurisdictions like in Quebec or like in the U.S., it is being dealt with primarily by their Commodity Futures Trading um, Commission. And some of you may be aware that the final guidance on the 28-day delivery rule was published by the CFTC yesterday. And, they, and the CFTC does have jurisdiction over spot, spot commodity markets in the U.S. Um, limited jurisdiction. So we don't, unfortunately, our registry, regulatory regime here is a lot more, it's, it's in a less developed stage. And I think it's, it's created challenges for the regulators. And I think that's why when you look at the guidance that's been published, going back to what we were talking about at the beginning, you see that it's saying you could be subject to, you're either trading in a security or a derivative. It doesn't even matter. It's something. It's something that we want to regulate. That much we know. But what it is it sort of varies between jurisdictions. And, and, and this is part of the reason that there's such a challenge in terms of like, well, if it's a derivative, but it's not a security, then shouldn't I be registered as a derivative dealer? Well, yes, but there's no such thing as a derivatives dealer in most jurisdictions. So this is where we are sort of at this regulatory crossroads. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Another semi-nuanced one. Um, are asset-backed stable coins or tokens considered securities under Canadian law? Specific example, <laughs> a gold-backed ERC-20 token where a thousand tokens can be redeemed on demand for one kilo, kilo of physical gold held in a Canadian vault. Could this be traded by a virtual currency, or, sorry, by a dealer in virtual currency or only by a registered broker dealer? Great question. I'm very familiar with this question. I know that this is a product that is available in other jurisdictions and that is being looked at here by a number of different businesses. Um, and I have the view that has been expressed by securities regulators, by some securities regulators is that because the definition of derivative under our securities laws is so broad, a, a, an asset-backed stable coin, like a gold-backed stable coin like that, could be considered, I, I, I won't even go beyond that, would, I would say would likely fall within the definition of derivative. But that being said, I think that there is an acknowledgement among securities regulators that physical custody of precious metals and you know that whole business is already an oper already operates and already has standards associated with it that's a separate registration that's a separate category of reporting um, under anti money laundering rules uh, precious metals and and so, wait dealers in precious metals and stones amber did i get that right d p yep, m s <laughs> um so and and and, the, and there are custodians that custody those assets and that do a good job of it and that are insured to do that. And there are examples of exchange traded funds that offer exposure to precious metals that have actually gotten relief from securities regulators to have the metals custodied at places like the Royal Canadian Mint and Brinks because those custodians provide as good or better security over precious metals than a dealer, a, a securities, a, a, a custodian of securities would. So I think while the answer is yes, likely a regulator would want to exert jurisdiction over it, would want to say that those jurisdictions, that those tokens are covered. I think that a regulator would also be open to figuring out the right way to regulate that dealer. In other words, when we're talking about the baseline investor protection objectives of securities laws, fraud, um, protecting investors from fraud, protecting investors from credit risk and insolvency risk, you're going to have to deal with those things. But are there going to be alternatives to, you know, some of the other requirements? Um, likely, I think that the regulators are going to be open to that. But it is, but but the expectation is that you're going to go to them and you're going to talk to them and you're going to negotiate this, which is going to take time and is going to take money as opposed to just running off and doing your business and taking the position that you're not regulated and these tokens are not securities or derivatives. I think that then you're going to be, you're going to be exposed to getting one of those letters that we're talking about. Okay. Does the answer to that change if the stable coin is backed by um, money? So if it's backed by Canadian dollars rather than gold, 
CFX stablecoins, separate but related topic. So I don't know if anybody saw this also, but yesterday or two days ago, IOSCO, which is the International Organization of Securities Regulators, published its report on fiat back stablecoins, um, on, on, on a global fiat back stablecoin specifically. So a Libra-like global um, payment token. Um, and what the message was, and I, I'm not pretending that I read it because it was like 100 pages and I only read the executive summary. But the message is that global banks are looking at this. Um, and, not global banks, sorry. Um, central banks are looking at this. The Financial Stability Board is looking at this. This is a global issue and it is more, it is probably better to be resolved through, you know, banks and monetary policy and fin the regulators of financial institutions, deposit taking institutions like banks and trust companies, then insure then securities regulators. They still preserve jurisdiction. They're not going to say, no, this is definitely not a security. But I think that they are willing to say, on these ones, we're going to take our lead from what the banking regulators are doing. Cool. Um, so I'd encourage audience members to um, to ask more questions, but I I have one that's come up in a, in a number of other contexts, um, which is I I suppose kind of a jurisdictional question, um, in the in a number of different regulatory regimes and and ways, Bitcoin for example as an asset has been declared not a security. So various regulators have looked at it and said, look, we don't think this is a security. Um, how does it then go to becoming captured under the security regime and sort of a what's changed, so to speak, in terms of that perspective? Sure. So I think that, that the securities regulators would acknowledge that Bitcoin is not a security. They, and I think that the two crypto assets where we have certainty on that are Bitcoin and Ether, that as, as of now, they are sufficiently decentralized to, cert, to fall without to fall outside the scope of investment contract, which is one of the prongs of the definition of security. And that's sort of the catch all. And if you're out of that and they don't fall within any of the other criteria, it's not a security. So that's why the staff interpretation notice that was published in January is say is not trying to regulate Bitcoin or Ether as a security. It's trying to regulate the platforms that are offering trading by say by saying platform you're not selling you're not selling bitcoin or ether you're selling the right to take future delivery of bitcoin and ether effectively you're selling a derivative the, and that's how they're or and they're saying they're selling a derivative or it could be a security it's a right because a security is also a a contract a right to receive something in the future a debt obligation is also a category of security so it, you know there are numerous constructs of that relationship that could work within the definition of security um, and and it's really the exposure to the ongoing risk associated with the platform I just want so um, it's because it was it's because I wanted to read this because I wanted to pull it up on my phone because my printer was offline and I wasn't able to print it, print it before the session, but I just wanted to read this is very important language from the staff notice, um, which really gets to the gist of the, of, the, of the issue. Platforms are not subject to securities legislation if each of the following apply. The underlying crypto asset itself is not a security or derivative, so we're good on Bitcoin, we're good on Ether, we are right. on a fiat backed stable coin right now. Maybe some of the other very sufficiently decentralized at crypto assets, but they're all up for debate. And then the contract or instrument for the purchase, sale, or delivery of a crypto asset, one, results in an obligation to make immediate delivery of the crypto asset and is settled by the immediate delivery of the crypto asset to the platform's user. Um, and so that the plot, so that the user is no longer exposed to any insolvency risk associated with the platform. So that is the key to the whole thing. So if your platform has accounts 
and your platform is holding all of its Bitcoin on Coinbase or Gemini or, um, you know, a very, a, another sort of secure custodian, your platform says, you're not subject to my insolvency risk. Like you're all the Bitcoin is in Coinbase. Don't worry. But the reality is, is that the Bitcoin is in the platform's account and the customer mm. only has a relationship with the platform. So the platform is maintaining its own ledger of whose Bitcoin is whose. Even if the platform is doing that totally legitimately and, and it's terms of use say that that has been sold. The reality is if something goes wrong with that platform, if all of a sudden the next morning, the client opens up their phone and they can no longer use that app on that platform, they can't access their Bitcoin and they can't go to Coinbase, the custodian and say, Hey, I've got a claim against you because the platform that I bought the Bitcoin from has an account and part of that Bitcoin's mine. Coinbase is going to say, oh, I don't know who you are. I only know who that platform is and they are they're no longer solvent. We took all their Bitcoin away. So, you know, so that's, that's the risk. That is the risk that this whole thing is being, that all of this regulation is designed to address. So if I'm, if I'm looking at my business operations right now, what does, what does immediate delivery mean, practically speaking? If I'm looking at it and saying, okay, I, I'll shift my model, I'll be less custodial, um, what's okay. the practical implication? So I think that that's where there's a little bit of room. That, that's where I think the discussions with the regulators are heading. Um, the regulators, when they say immediate, we're talking about like, it is going directly into, this is what I think actually, I haven't confirmed this with the regulator, but this is what I expect. That the, that the purchaser has its own private, has its own address, its own wallet that's outside of the platform, that's either a hardware wallet or a software wallet, and it is directing the platform to deliver the um, coins directly to its wallet. That wallet may be on another non-Canadian exchange, like a Binance or somewhere else, which is sort of the sad reality of where we're at right now. Um, but as long as that, as long as that, that the Bitcoin is being delivered and, and we're talking about public ledger delivered. So it's being moved to a different address on the Bitcoin blockchain. So it's no longer in any way controlled or possessed by the platform, but it's been, it's arguably controlled and possessed by the customer who's directed the platform where to deliver it, that's immediate physical delivery. My understanding in talking to a number of different platforms that are doing different things, not just spot transactions, but that may be offering other and related services, including sort of selling a customer's Bitcoin. So if you're, if you're offering, um, if you're offering sort of brokerage, so you can, you can sell your Bitcoin on the platform. Well, if you want to sell it on the platform, you're going to have to put it on the platform before you sell it. Is moving the plot, is moving the Bitcoin onto the platform's address with the, with the expectation that you're going to instruct the platform to sell it or that you're going to sell it within, you know, the next few hours or the next day or the next two days. Does that give rise to the same, um, you know, dealer registration rip? risk like is it or is that something else is that something less if the if the similarly like if the delivery isn't immediate but if there's a time lag in order to allow for like security procedures a multi-signature authentication a kyc some kind of ver verification is that is that also going to throw you offside or is there some kind of number of minutes or hours where it is okay for the platform to retain custody in order primarily for security reasons without tripping up this registration requirement. So I think that that's where there is a dialogue that will be had or that should be had um, to drill down on those points a little bit more. This is very different when you're talking about it from um, what you would see for existing money services businesses, for instance, where they like they'll talk about trade plus two days. Um, in terms of when does a transaction settle and how captured could they be under a lot of legislation. And it's, it's really about from the time that, you know, that you get that trade to the time that you settle it, it's two business days. 
and and that's kind of the threshold but that's not the expectation here at all well again i mean this is this is this is interesting because my understanding is that a lot of the risk associated with these platforms and a lot of the risk that the regulators are focused on is that transactions take too long that and and, and that a lot of these platforms because the banks um, are largely unwilling to provide services to platforms. Platforms are relying on other types of payment processors and they themselves have service providers that are creating time lags and that are creating, that are giving rise to other risks. So I think that even though, you know, the timeline for a traditional, uh, for, for a spot currency settlement should be reasonable, you know, if, if it's, if it takes two business days and I didn't know that you, I, I didn't know that a, a uh, spot FX trade took two business days to settle. That's certainly the case for a security. There's a lot of them that are settled immediately, but but that's that's sort of the threshold where they can fall into that purview. So so and and it used to be, and I think that uh, we've moved to a T plus one settlement cycle in Canada too for securities now. Um, but I think that I think that the regulator is not is going to have a hard time. The, the, the risk, the execution risk is so closely associated with the investor protection concerns of the regulator that I think saying, you know, it's going to take one or two or seven days because it takes a long time to move this money because we're dealing with a payment processor is just not going to be a good answer for the regulators, you know, so I, I think that they're going to say, well, in that case, your clients are at risk of your plot or you're putting your clients at risk for that period of time. And for that period, and our view is not until the client takes delivery of the asset, has it been, has ownership transferred. So if you could get that done instantaneously, I, but which I understand is a challenge um, or within a few minutes, I think you're, you'll be in a better position to say we're totally non-custodial. All right. That, that makes sense. Um, I think we've we got, got a, another question. Yep. Um, okay, so broadly speaking, a key practical challenge we have in Canada is that we have provincial regulators. We have the virtual CSA, but provinces don't always have the same interpretations and dealers have to register in every jurisdiction. What's your view uh, when we might see real harmonization across the country to reduce the regulatory burden for everyone across the country? Never. That's my view. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story. When I was a fourth year associate, um, a securities law associate, I, I want to say it was mm, late 90s, early 2000s. There was an initiative of the Ontario government. It was called the Crawford Panel. And it was the Ontario government's initiative to try to get, to develop a design for a national securities regulator that would be, um, that would, would be appealing enough to the provinces that it would get um, buy-in from the provinces. And I was the keen mid-level securities associate that, associate that got tapped to work on this panel. And there were leading capital markets participants across, across Canada that were trying to get this done. And I went into my mentor's office, who is now retired. And I said to her, Linda, her name is Linda Curry. She's a, the queen of mutual funds in Canada. And I said, Linda, guess what? I'm on this panel. Isn't this great? We're going to do it. We're going to get a national securities regulator. She, she, leaned out, she reached under her desk and she pulled out for me a paper, thick, um, like old publication from 1982 that said, national, we're looking to achieve a national securities regulator. And she said, I was working on this in 1982 when I was your age. This is never going to happen. And we have seen so many, and, and at the time I was like, what do you mean? I think this time it's, we've got a real chance. But there is so much fragmentation and the way that our constitution is, works and the, the paramountcy of each province having um, jurisdiction over property and civil rights in the, in the province and the sort of the, the territoriality and the, of, that each 
provincial securities regulator has over its own capital markets participants, which, which have their own little industry clusters across Canada, makes the, it actually makes the level of harmonization that we have now pretty impressive. And um, I just, unless it is considered to be a national security, unless it rises to the level where it's a national security risk to continue to have 13 separate regulators, this is not going to get done, in my view. Baza. The comments from the chat are basically, ouch, um, and when harmony, question mark, never. Sorry, don't, <laughs> um, I would say don't quote me on that, but I, I actually, <laughs> I've never been quoted by that uh, in the mainstream media or anything, but that really is um, my view. I just don't think, I think that we have to operate on the assumption that it's going to continue to be 13 regulators that are doing their best to achieve harmony. And this is an area where I think that the regulators really do try their best. They consult with each other, they try. And that's part of the reason why things take so long here is because nobody wants to set a precedent that's going to, that it's going to take another jurisdiction by surprise. There really is an attempt at harmony, harmonization, but it's, it's difficult. Um, I can tell you, and Amber, you might have, I mean, like Quebec has done things, uh, has gone out on its own in a few different areas. Quebec's regime for provincially registering money services businesses is unique in Canada. And I think that um, customers, money services businesses, customers in Quebec do have probably have a level of protection that they that doesn't exist in the rest of the country. Um, so this is one that I, I, no, I think this is really fascinating is, I mean, especially when we talk about um, cases like Quadriga, because one of the things that Quebec has for its money services businesses is actually a license. So it's, it's not a registration with FinTrack, you're filling out a form as a money service business. Um, it's a relatively quick um, process. There's very little by way of background check. The Quebec licensing process actually requires you to submit a number of different documents. Uh, it's, I would say that it's very much in parallel with what you see in EU countries in terms of process. Um, and there are background checks for your owners and principals and, the, and, and they do a much more thorough background check. So while we saw Quadriga be registered with FinTrack for a period in time, they were not licensed by the AMF um, at, at any point that I'm aware of, nor do I think that they could have been. Um, I, I just think that, you know, it was very public that they had uh, a co-founder that was a known fraudster and criminal and, and it took very little research to figure that out. And I, I don't know that the Quebec regulator um, would have ever allowed the licensing process to proceed. Um, so I, I do think that there's merit in having some of those things. We got into a big conversation with the Canadian Money Service Business Advocacy Committee recently um, because I, I generally think the same thing, that harmonization is better where we can have it. Um, and I would, with money services businesses, I would much rather see a stronger licensing regime federally um, than a bunch of different regimes provincially where there were these licensing processes but um, you're right in saying that that's, that's apparently at its core a constitutional issue, um, and it seems unlikely, at least in the short term, that we're going to see that type of licensing for MSBs on a federal level. So uh, I, I think that um, not like not to throw you know, fuel on the fire of, of when is this going to happen, never. Um, I think that in other related industries like money service businesses, we're actually heading towards uh, more different provincial regulatory regimes to try to fill in the gaps where the federal regime just doesn't seem to be doing enough to protect people. And I do think that, uh, that part of the reason that the securities regulators have come in to fill this void is because the money services regulatory regime here is, is basically nothing. Like, they, like, like you'll see if and when platforms do approach, you know, registration as a dealer in, and, and as a securities lawyer, the idea of, I would much prefer for this to be something different, being registered as a platform 
not having to say that you're trading in securities or derivatives. I, I would like, I would prefer to see a new registration category that really does, um, you know, really does capture digital assets as being different. Um, but I, but you will have to submit yourself to, to that initial review and ongoing, you know, compliance requirements, oversight reporting that is not there. And I think that if it was there for money services businesses, like it, there would be less of a need for it or their securities regulators would feel less compelled to be rushing to get involved. Fair. Um, I, I have to wonder if, if that's why just at least reputationally uh, BC seems to have been one of the more friendly regulators that we've heard about in this space um, in that they are looking at MSB licensing in a different way right now. Um, like it's BC. Fairly speculative. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what B, where BC is at on, on um, money services business. I know that generally BC, the BC Securities Commission is considered to be um, a flexible regulator that is very much interested in promoting innovation. Um, there is a, there's a big fintech and a big startup sort of scene out there. Um, and so this, it could be in keeping with also that sort of ethos. Yeah. Um, and so another somewhat related question that, uh, that came into me the other day was um, whether in order to find out if you're a securities dealer or not, it makes sense to try to go through a province's regulatory sandbox? Um, I think the answer to that question, before the guidance came out, I would have said, go get advice from your council and rely on that advice for now. Post-regulatory guidance, um, I think that that's a better, I think that engaging in a dialogue with the regulator is going to happen. Um, and the sandbox is, it, it, it depends on the regulator, but the sandbox is a good place to start. They, Typically speaking, they would have the most expertise in digital assets. They would understand more what your business is doing, um, but they would be consulting most likely with sort of the market regulation and the, um, you know, part of the, of the, um, of the regulator to fully, to get a sense of the full scope of of what you're doing and and the extent to which it triggers an e-registration. But but yes, I mean, but again, I would say that approach the sandbox, but still get external counsel involved. Like don't just open up your kimono to the sandbox, be strategic about, and 100% tra transparent and candid, but not, you know, answer the questions that are asked of you. Don't, you don't have to go over the top and share stuff that they never asked about and that they don't need or want to know about. Cool. That, so that actually brings me back to one of the first questions and, and after this, maybe we'll take one more audience question and then wrap it up. Um, but in terms of enforcement powers, uh, what does that look like? So what, what is, when you say there's a risk of enforcement and there's a risk of receiving enforcement letters, um, what are the powers that provincial securities commissions generally have? Um, so the, so, and I, I'm actually, so, so the administrative proceedings that the securities, that the, that the um, securities regulators can bring against, uh, you know, uh, mar capital mar market participant, um, the types of, of penalties that, that can be applied are fines, um, significant fines, disgorgement, um, ban, they can ban people from, from the industry. Um, they, and they can also, and I'm just, those are, those are sort of the main, those are the main things. They can ban a business like a, a but also individuals from, engaging in capital markets activities. Um, and that, but then, the, but they, they have, it's not the same as criminal. Like there's also the criminal law. And so if you're, if you're not, there's no fraud, like there's anti-fraud powers under the Securities Act and certainly fraud, engaging in securities fraud is an offense under the Securities Act, but it doesn't alleviate, like being subject to the securities enforcement proceeding doesn't mean that you're not also going to be subject to like 
criminal or civil fraud um, offenses as well. So you have, and certainly I would say that the securities regulators would work with law enforcement if they think that an offense, that if they think that conduct or misconduct should also be considered by, by law enforcement. Okay. All right, we've got one last fairly uh, topical timely. Um, and timely yeah, question. Um, and you may not know the answer, but this is just general. Um, is the OSC and other regulatory agencies fully operational during the COVID crisis? Oh, I do know the answer. <laughs> um, so of the OSC is working remotely right now, but they are fully engaged. They have published on their website some areas where they're, you know, they're carving back, they're scaling back on their activities right now. For example, they've canceled all in-person hearings up till April 30th, but they are, I believe that they are still going ahead with proceedings that have been scheduled during that period of time, but the proceedings are being conducted remotely. It's not clear from their guidance whether or not they're going to be um, scheduling new hearings and new matters during this time. Um, they have also, they've extended, they've offered sort of a blanket filing deadline extension for all filings that are due up until June 1st are getting a 45 day filing extension. They've said that they're sort of cutting back on their normal, some of their normal course audit type of activities, but They've also said, you know, we're still open for business. Capital markets um, is an essential service. We're protecting the capital markets and they're continuing to, um, you know, work their cases and do, do their work. So um, if you've received a letter and there's a deadline in the letter to provide um, answers, that deadline is, is, is up. That deadline remains enforceable. Is there potentially room to move that deadline by a couple of weeks because of COVID-19? Yes. And I don't think the regulators are going to be unreasonable about that, but you need to, but don't, you can't assume that you, you can't treat it as like, oh, they sh they're not going to be there in my response. If you do want a deadline extension for a reasonable reason, you should be going and asking your regulator for that. Fair. Um, and I, I would say that FinTrack, um, from an anti-money laundering perspective, is in, in much the same boat. Um, they are operating remotely to the extent that they can. Um, they have established a, a particular email address that's posted on their website. If there are any delays in reporting um, specifically related to suspicious transaction reports, um, there's an expectation that there's going to be communication with them around any obligations um, that are you know, that a reporting entity has missed during COVID, uh, but there, there is a sense that there will be some leniency with that. Uh, they just want to make sure that they're still getting the most important strategic intelligence. So on, on that note, um, everyone be safe. Uh, stay healthy, be well. Thank you so much, Lori. Uh, this has been, this has been our first uh, remote meetup. So Feel free to get in touch with us um, for some additional topics that you'd like to hear more about, and we will make sure that we get in some good speakers to talk with us about it. This is the first time that we've done something that wasn't a panel, um, and that isn't specifically COVID related. That was just because when I thought about having a panel on the securities topic, the thought of having anyone else talk on it other than Lori when it could just be the Lori show was overwhelming for me uh, because she's that awesome. So oh, here we sure. are. Thank well, you so much for spending the time with us. Thanks, my pleasure.